Okay, welcome everyone to our last podcast of the term. This is chapter 19 dealing with development and inheritance. So what we're going to discuss here are the processes whereby a fertilized egg becomes first a, a zygote and then a morula, then a blastocyst and then an embryo and then a fetus and then a neonate and then a human being. So we'll start with a discussion of genetics and inheritance where we'll relay the basic principles of genetics to the inheritance of human traits. We'll identify several chromosomal disorders and describe three tests performed during pregnancy used to detect abnormal fetal development. And we'll start with the discussion of inheritance. This is the transfer of genetically determined characteristics from generation to generation. Genetics is defined as the study of mechanisms responsible for inheritance. Now, every trait that we can measure, a trait is any characteristic that we can put a metric to, is going to have what I would call an, an upper and a lower limit. Okay, so this would be the ceiling. And this would be the floor for that particular characteristic. Okay, we could take an example like uh, body weight. That is a trait. And every individual is going to have a body weight value above which they cannot go and below which they cannot fall or else they'll enter a state of disease on either extreme. And if we get too far outside these upper and lower limits, we have death. Every trait, whether it be body weight or height or skin color or intelligence, has two components to it. There is a genetic component which comes from the DNA that you inherit from your mother and father that are broken into information packets called genes which code for proteins that carry out cell function and the combined action of these proteins leads to the biological component of a trait and then we have the environmental component which represents how the trait is affected by interactions with the environment. And different traits are going to have different percentages of their expression related either to environment or to genetics. With that in mind, we define the genotype as the chromosomes and component genes that are a lot like the blueprints that a house architect uses in order to build a new structure, while the phenotype is the anatomical and physical characteristics displayed by your pattern of genetic expression. And so that is essentially the physical manifestation of the trait. The phenotype takes into account both the environmental and genetic components while the genotype is simply the genetic component. As an example, okay, going back to our, our example of body weight, where we have an upper and a lower limit for body weight. And if we get above the upper limit, we have disease and possibly death. And if we get below the lower limit, we have disease and possibly death. Okay, The genetic component of body weight has to do with the enzymes that are able to convert the food that you eat into energy in the form of ATP and how effectively the excess calories that are not burned 
get stored as body fat. Okay. Um, it also has to do with how effectively you can build or how, how much muscle mass you have. Okay. The genetic part of body weight has to do with your diet and exercise regimen. And so that will determine where within this window you fall, okay, the environmental part, whereas the genetic part determines the absolute upper and lower boundaries. Okay? And that's true again for any trait. So this is analogous to the physical appearance of the house. A trait is anything that we can measure. Now a karyotype is the entire set of chromosomes in an individual cells. Now you remember that you get 23 chromosomes from your mother and 23 from your father. And their combination leads to your genotype. Okay, The two chromosomes together are grouped as homologous chromosomes. Essentially they contain similar information on both DNA molecules. Although the information is not identical, it's close enough that these molecules are capable of locating each other during the process of cell division known as meiosis. So you can see here an example of a typical karyotype for a male. You've got a pair of chromosomes 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on all the way down to chromosome pair 22. And then the last set of chromosomes are called the sex chromosomes. In the male, you inherit an X from the mother and a Y from the father. In the female, you inherit an X chromosome from both the mother and the father. Notice that the chromosomes are arranged in size from 1 being the biggest to 22 being the smallest. And also note that these chromosomes stain somewhat similarly. This is a stain called Giemsa stain and we use it to essentially uh, tag the chromosomes at metaphase of mitosis. We then um, essentially trap the dividing cells at metaphase of mitosis. We rupture the cell nucleus and then we stain the chromosomes with the Giemsa stain and then take a photograph of them and then we arrange them using a computer program like a lot like Photoshop in pairs so that we can see what the total genetic complement of the chromosomes is in the nucleus of a particular body cell from an individual. Okay. 22 of the 23 pairs are called autosomal chromosomes and they contain primarily body plan information while the sex chromosomes contain information that determines the gender and also has uh, quite a bit to say about how the reproductive structures develop. Now that said, um, on the X chromosome there is some body plan information. We know that because there are certain diseases that are inherited on the X chromosome that show up predominantly in males due to the fact that the Y chromosome has no counterbalancing information to cover for defective genes on the X chromosome and those include diseases like hemophilia and muscular dystrophy and color blindness <coughs> and those affect body systems other than the reproductive system. The Y chromosome carries only one trait and that is the trait of being male. Okay. Chromosomes match up in homologous pairs during meiosis. The chromosomes in a homologous pair have the same structure and carry genes affecting the same trait. Genes found at the same location or locus on each chromosome determine the expression of the trait. Two chromosomes may carry the same or different form of a particular gene and we call those different forms of a gene alleles. If you have the exact same allele on both chromosomes of a homologous pair you're said to be homozygous for that particular trait whereas if you have different alleles for a, a particular trait on a homologous pair of chromosomes you're said to be heterozygous for that particular trait. The average autosomal pair contains approximately a thousand pairs of alleles different 
alleles are going to produce different effects. And the way that we inherit traits can follow one of three different patterns that we will discuss. There's simple dominance and recessiveness as one way to inherit a trait. There's incomplete dominance. There's multigenic inheritance. And there is um, what we call incomplete penetrance. So those are all different possible ways to inherit a trait. And in addition, we should add that there are traits that are sex-linked. They can either be sex-linked dominant or sex-linked recessive. And um, the way that we determine that they're sex-linked is that they reside on the X chromosome. Again, the Y chromosome having only one trait, the trait of being male. The phenotype from a heterozygous genotype depends on how corresponding alleles interact. The most common form of interaction is simple inheritance, where we have strict dominance or recessiveness. Any dominant allele present is expressed in the genotype. For example, even if you have only one allele for freckles, you will have freckles. So the freckle allele is dominant to the non-freckle allele while the recessive allele is only expressed if it is present on both chromosomes of a homologous pair. So you have to get one copy from both your mom and dad, the exact same flavor of that recessive gene, in order for that version of the trait to be expressed. One of the ways that we can determine the likelihood of a particular trait showing up in a population is to do what we call a Punnett square analysis, where dominant alleles are indicated by capital letters, and recessive ones are indicated by lowercase level letters. As an example, capital T tap capital T would indicate a homozygous individual for that particular trait, whereas big T little t would be heterozygous for that particular trait, and little t little t would be homozygous recessive. Punnett squares are used to predict genetic probabilities. In albinism, for example, we have the inability to make the pigment melanin. The albinism gene is recessive to the gene for normal pigmentation. If a father who is homozygous for normal pigmentation marries someone who is homozygous for albinism and they have children, all the children will inherit a normal pigmentation allele from the father and an albino allele from the mother and the result will be that all the children will have normal pigmentation because the, the dominant form of the allele will mask the effects of the recessive form. However, if we were to have an individual who carried the albinism gene marry somebody who is an albino, we would find that 50% of the children would have normal pigmentation, while 50% would be albino. Now, you might ask, well, how are these... Punnett squares filled out, and it's relatively straightforward. Essentially what we do <coughs> is we put the potential eggs that the mother can make with regard to a particular allele on the top of the square. So the potential eggs are up here. The potential sperm are down here. And notice that these are haploid cells, so they're only going to have one copy of the gene that we're, we're discussing. And then what you do is you fill the square top down. Okay, you can see the little a allele is going from the top down. And then you fill the square from left to right. So you can see here the capital A allele is propagated through these two squares uh, and these two squares as well. Okay, filling from left to right. And that's how we determine on any one particular birth the likelihood of getting a particular genotype and phenotype. Now what you have to keep in mind is that chance has no memory. Okay, this is very important to understand. Chance has no memory. Okay meaning that just because you got a certain result on a previous event that does not have any bearing on what a subsequent event will produce. Okay, When we look, for instance, at this particular uh, mating, we have an albino woman marrying a 
man that carries the albinism gene, what we're saying with these probabilities is if they have a large number of children, the likelihood is that approximately 50% will have normal pigmentation and approximately 50% will be albino. But that doesn't necessarily mean, for instance, if they had one albino child with the first birth, that the next child would have normal pigmentation. Okay, It's just like flipping a coin. You can take a coin and flip it ten times, and you're going to get something approaching 50% heads and tails, but it may not be exact. Okay, Just because you flip a head on the first flip, for instance, doesn't mean that you'll get a tail on the second flip, and so on. Okay, So those are essentially the rules of probability. Um, when you have discrete probabilities, you always add um, the probabilities together if you're asking a question that involves the, the term or, and you always multiply the probabilities when you use the term and. Okay, As an example, um, if we had people flipping coins simultaneously and we asked the question, well, what is the possibility that on a given simultaneous flip that we would get two heads okay, from each flip, that would be a 50% chance for flip number one and 50% chance from the other simultaneous flip. We would multiply those because we want one head and another head, and the result would be one in four possibility of getting that result. Okay? If we asked the same, a similar question and we said, what's the probability of getting a head and a tail on a given flip, well, we would have a, a one-fourth chance of, say, um, the first flip being the head and the second flip being a tail, or we could have a one-fourth possibility of the reverse result. They would both result in a head and a tail, and so we would add those possibilities, and we would get two out of four, or a possibility of one-half, 50%. Okay? So that's how you deal with probability in language. Polygenic inheritance are the phenotypic results of the interactions of several genes together on a particular trait. This is the result um, that depends on the nature of the alleles and how these alleles interact to form other genes. Examples of, of um, traits that are inherited as polygenic traits include things like skin color, hair color, body weight, and, and height. Okay? Those are just a few examples. And so in the case of polygenic inheritance, instead of getting discrete probabilities as we saw with the Punnett square, okay, we instead get what we call a normal curve where if we plot it, the individuals in the population would form a bell curve where um, this would be the, the metric for the trait. Let's say this is height. Okay? Okay? This would be the metric for the trait, and this would be the number of individuals with that trait in the population. And you would say that most of them cluster around an average height. Okay. Okay. Chromosome abnormalities can involve thousands of genes, so are usually lethal. Variations in the structure of individual genes are relatively common. More than 99% of human nucleotide bases are the same in all individuals. Approximately 1.4 million single base differences or single nucleotide polymorphisms exist, and some are associated with specific diseases. An example of a chromosomal abnormality is trisomy 21, where we have an extra chromosome 21 in each of that individual's body cells. It's the most common viable chromosome abnormality. Notice that chromosome 21 is one of the smallest chromosomes. It causes mental retardation and physical malformation. The degree of mental retardation ranges from moderate to severe. 
Anatomical problems affecting the cardiovascular system are often fatal. In adulthood, they may develop Alzheimer's disease prior to age 40. And we find that there is a direct correlation between maternal age and the risk of having a child with trisomy 21. With the risk increasing from 1 in 2,000 before age 25 to 1 in 900 <coughs> between ages 30 and 34, and after age 35, <coughs> approximately 1 in 50, okay? So if we do the math, which we can do real quick here, you've got a, a 2,000 over 50-fold increase for that particular trait. We can simplify here. 200 over 5, 5 goes into 5 once and 5 goes into 240 times, okay? And so we have a 40-fold increase in the possibility of this trisomy after age 35, based on studies that we can do. Now, why does this happen? Well, we think that part of the reason for this is an, a, a phenomenon that's called non-disjunction. Okay, non-disjunction. And in non-disjunction, what happens is when a gamete is being formed, we have an extra chromosome brought in during meiosis 1 or in some cases meiosis 2 this can be due to a defect in the spindle apparatus or it could be due to an unusual attachment between two chromosomes that does not come apart during this aberrant meiotic process and the result is that we generate a zygote that either has an extra chromosome in it or is missing a chromosome <coughs> and the results as you can see in the case of trisomy 21, are quite dramatic. Now this is just one of the many trisomies that are possible. Others include Kleinfelters and Turners, which are aneuploides of the sex chromosomes. An aneuploid condition is any condition that is an individual with other than 46 chromosomes in their body cells. And this can produce a variety of defects. For instance, in Kleinfelters, we see the <coughs> sex chromosome pattern XXY. We have a male phenotype that has reduced androgen production. The testes fail to mature, and this causes sterility. The breasts are slightly enlarged, and this occurs in one in 750 male births. But again, it's much more frequent in females over the age of 35, for the same reason that trisomy 21 is more frequent. In Turner syndrome, the individual has only a single X chromosome. It's a type of chromosomal deletion called a monosomy. The phenotype is a normal female with an estimated occurrence in 1 in 2,500 births, but the female does not mature at puberty. The ovaries are non-functional and they have negligible estrogen production, and physical abnormalities include short stature, low set ears and a webbed neck. This is primarily due to the fact that a lot of what's on the X chromosome um, affects the secondary sex characteristics but there is also body plan information on the X chromosome and that's why we see some of these manifestations in other body systems. Now you'll notice that um, if you look at the literature we very seldom see um, aneuploidies that involve the, the larger chromosomes, okay? For instance, these guys here and here, okay? We, we seldom see aneuploidies of these types. These are the large chromosomes, the large autosomes. And these contain body plan information.
And you might ask, okay, well, well, why don't we see these aneuploidies as much as we do the aneuploidies of the smaller chromosomes and the sex chromosomes? And the reason is due to the, the nature of the information and the amount of information that's on these larger chromosomes. You could think of this very much like the way a house is, a house is built from scratch. If you've ever seen it done, you, you buy a plot of land and then you dig a hole and then you pour a foundation and then you put up a frame and then you put siding on the frame, you put a roof on the frame, you put in internal insulation and electrical wiring and plumbing and then you paint the inside and the outside of the house, you put in the doors and windows, you hook up the electric and the plumbing and then you have a functioning home. In order for that to happen properly, you have to have the right materials in the right place at the right time and in the right amount. And you also have to have the proper work crew on hand to use those materials. And if that doesn't happen, and if early steps are performed incorrectly, the likelihood is the house is not going to be structurally sound and it may very well fall over. And the same is true for building a new human being. The body plan chromosomes, the autosomes, contain information to build proteins that are designed to assist in the construction of all the body systems, the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, the pulmonary system, and so on. And if they're present in the wrong amount or if they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, those early mistakes in the formation of the body systems will become so profound that the likelihood that we'll make a functioning individual at the end of the day is negligible. Right? and the result is likely a spontaneous abortion. So this is why we very seldom see aneuploidies of the larger chromosomes as live births because the mistakes become so fast and furious early in the process that we can't manage to make it to full term. And that's why with the smaller chromosomes you can sometimes manage to make it to full term because the mistakes aren't going to be as profound and affect as many body systems. Notice um, also when you search the literature that you never ever find um, an aneuploidy which would be YO, okay, like Turner's is XO, YO, uh, does not exist. And the reason for this is likely um, that the X chromosome contains body plan information critical for life. And if you don't have one, you can't form a new human being. Okay. okay. Excellent characteristics are described as those that reside on the X chromosome. Notice that the X chromosome is much larger than the Y and can carry genes that affect body plan uh, formation. These genes are called X-linked or sex-linked. There is no corresponding allele on the Y chromosome. Many are associated with identifiable diseases or deficits such as color blindness, muscular dystrophy, hemophilia, and so on. As an example, color blindness is a sex-linked recessive. Its gene product is necessary to form a retina that can distinguish colors when viewed um, and perceived by the brain. An individual who's colorblind has an inability to distinguish certain colors from each other. The colors appear to be the same shade. Males with a dominant allele have normal color vision, while males with a recessive allele have red-green color blindness, meaning that they cannot distinguish between the colors red and green. Females can have a dominant and recessive allele and still have normal color vision. The reason for this, again, is that they have at least one normal allele providing them the ability to form the photoreceptors in the retina that can distinguish between the different shades of color. Females have to have two recessive alleles in order to exhibit red-green color blindness, and in the general population, this is exceedingly rare. What you're looking at here are some tests that we can perform during pregnancy in order to determine 
whether there's going to be an abnormality in development. In amniocentesis, we insert a needle into the woman's abdomen during the fetal stage of development and withdraw amniotic fluid, which contains cells that were once part of the developing fetus. They'll have the exact same chromosome structure as the cells that are in the fetal body. We can then freeze those cells at metaphase, rupture them, stain the chromosomes, and generate a karyotype and determine whether or not that individual is going to have a chromosomal abnormality. Okay? In addition, we can also take that genetic material and test for the presence of defective genes if we know that a particular genetic abnormality runs in a family. Okay? We call this process PCR. Okay? So in PCR what we do is we isolate DNA from these cells that are in the amniotic fluid. Okay, this is the double-stranded DNA. And then we can treat that DNA with a solution that contains an enzyme that builds new DNA even at high temperatures, building, building blocks for DNA, and also artificial pieces of DNA that are called primers. And what we do is we take that reaction and then cycle it um, through a series of temperature changes and we manufacture the DNA that is in the region of the gene that we're checking. Okay, so we make many many copies of that particular region of DNA. So if we were example to say draw in the primers here, okay, you might have one primer that would sit up here and would work its way into the gene. Another primer would sit here and then when we put in the enzymes that build the DNA and mix it with nucleotides, we would build new DNA that would go across the areas that are flanked by the primers. And then we can take that DNA and we can determine the sequence. And if the sequence matches that of a defective gene, then we can let the parents know that their infant is either going to carry or actually have a particular genetic disorder. In amniotic fluid analysis, uh, we can do karyotyping to determine the presence of normal chromosomes in the proper number. Um, we can also look for the presence of bilirubin, which have increased values, can indicate possible neural tube defects such as spina bifida and anencephaly, which is the lack of a brain in the cranial cavity. Um, increased bilirubin values may indicate the degree of hemolysis of fetal red cells by the mother's Rh antibodies as well. And that's a condition known as erythroblastosis fetalis, in which the mother becomes sensitized to the Rh antigen if she's Rh negative um, as a result of exposure, either, um, for instance, as a result of a mismatched transfusion or when she has her first Rh positive child, the um, neonatal blood and the maternal blood will mix and she'll have an exposure to that antigen generating antibodies to it between the first and second pregnancy. She has a second Rh positive child. Her antibodies can cross the placental barrier, lyse the red blood cells, and potentially kill the child. So that's another thing we can check for with amniotic fluid analysis. Alpha fetoprotein is checked around week 16 of gestation. A value of 5.7 to 31.5 nanograms per milliliter is um, diagnostic uh, for normal development. It lowers with increasing gestational age. It detects chromosomal defects such as those that are present in Down syndrome. So if our values are outside of what we expect, um, this can support um, the likelihood that the child will be born with trisomy 21. Okay, um, stay tuned for a, uh, a discussion of human development and a discussion of Punnett squares and genetics. Uh, this concludes our podcasting for the term. Hopefully you've enjoyed these and found them informative, and I will see everybody uh, in the next class, hopefully. Good luck to everyone. Hi, I'm Mr. Dove, and welcome to Bio Lessons to Go, 
Genetics, the Science of Heredity. People have been trying to understand how traits are passed from parents to offspring for quite some time. Most people could deduce the fact that parents do pass on their traits to their offspring because offspring resemble parents. But how that occurs was a major question. In the early days, the idea was that traits were a blend of the parents' traits, um, kind of like two colors of paint mixing together to create a blend. Now this theory of inheritance was actually discredited by a scientist by the name of Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk who studied plants. He was a botanist. Now because uh, he was studying plants, one of the things he was looking at was the traits of how traits were passed from one generation to the next. His work laid the foundations for our understanding of the fundamentals of genetics. Um, for this reason, Mendel is oftentimes referred to as the father of genetics. Now, the focus of Mendel's work were the common garden pea. Now, he probably chose to study garden peas because they were easy to grow, and they're available in a lot of readily distinguishable varieties. Now, most of us are familiar with you know, green peas. And most of the green peas that, that we get in the grocery store, um, they are, you know, they're nice and round and puffy. Um, but peas actually have a lot of very distinguishable traits. If we looked at their flower, um, some of them, the flower grows at the top. Um, another way that this is referred to as a terminal flower. Um, sometimes they grow on the side, which is referred to as an axial flower. Um, some stems, some of the pea plants grow really tall, while some grow short, sometimes referred to as a dwarf variety. Um, we've got our round peas, we've got wrinkled peas, green peas, even yellow peas. So there's a lot of very distinguishable characteristics um, that parent pea plants can pass on to their offspring. Now, in order for Mendel to work with pea plants and to exercise strict control over how the pea plants mated, he had to have a fundamental understanding of how flowering plants reproduce. Now, the main reproductive part of a flowering plant is the flower. When we look at the flower, um, it's going to have a male and a female portion. The stamen is our male portion of the flower, and it produces the pollen. And the pistil is the female portion of our flower, and it produces the egg. Pollen will fall from the, uh, the tips of the stamens, called the anther, onto the sticky stigma of the pistil. Um, the pollen then is going to be able to fertilize the eggs, which are down in the ovary of our flower. So reproduction in flowers occurs when pollen is transferred from the male part, the stamen, to the female part, the pistil of the flower. This is called pollination. Now there are two types of pollination, self-pollination and cross-pollination. In self-pollination, pollen is going to be transferred from the stamen to the pistil in the same flower or in flowers of the same plant. And that's going to create purebred strains. So pollen is going to fall from the stamen onto the pistil of the same flower. They are self-pollinating, self-fertilizing. In that way, um, there's no recombination of genes. Um, it's the same parent, both male and female, in terms of um, the genetic complement. So this is going to create purebred varieties. And so Mendel used this self-pollination to create purebred strains. For example, he could create purebred tall or purebred short by allowing them to self-fertilize. He called these purebred generations his P generation, P for parental varieties. Cross-pollination is when pollen from one flower stamen is transferred to the pistil of another flower. 
Mendel was able to use this technique to create crossbreeds. What he would do is he would remove um, the male part from one flower and then use um, a paintbrush or some people have said perhaps even the rear end of a, of a honeybee to be able to then pollinate um, from one flower to the next. Um, in doing this, um, he was able to ensure the parentage um, of his crosses. To make sure that no further pollination would take place, he would then cover his flowers um, with uh, little burlap sacks to make sure that they did not um, further um, encounter fertilization. So Mendel cross-pollinated his pea generations and then he looked at the traits that were inherited in the offspring. These offspring he called his F1 generation where F is, stands for filial which is Latin for sons. So this was like the first sons, the first children um, from that generation. So for example, he would take his purebred tall and cross that with his purebred short to see what would happen. Now if blending were taking place, a tall cross with short, you would get some sort of medium. But in this case, all of the pea plants were tall which told us that blending did not take place. And so what people were thinking for so long was incorrect. It was disproven from this experiment. Uh, traits don't blend. There were no medium plants. So Mendel was wondering, what happened to the short trait? Did it disappear? To test this, he crossed his F1 generation, his hybrid tall plants. To see what would happen. Surprisingly, in the second generation, the F2 generation, the short trait came back. So it didn't disappear after all. So based upon his observations, Mendel learned quite a bit and put together a few conclusions, which we call Mendel's principles. First, Mendel concluded that each individual um, carries two inheritable factors which today we call alleles for their traits. But you're only going to inherit one allele for each trait from each parent. In other words, each parent is going to give half of their genetic material to their offspring. What's really remarkable is Mendel was able to determine this not by understanding or knowing that chromosomes exist, but just through his mathematical deductions that it seemed like each parent was giving half of their traits to their offspring. Next, he deduced that some factors would actually mask or cover up other factors. That some alleles were actually dominant over others, and they would hide the expression of the weaker one, the recessive factor. Mendel ca called this his principle of dominance. So, even though um, a hybrid tall has a short gene, um, it's going to look tall because the tall trait is going to mask or cover the recessive one. Lastly, Mendel figured out that blending did not take place. That instead, the alleles stayed separate and independent of each other um, and could segregate away from one another um, in the next generation. In other words, the hybrid tall, can, the hybrid tall plant can actually pass down um, that recessive short gene again to the next generation so that in the F2 we saw that the short trait came back. Now Mendel's conclusions are based largely on mathematical probability. In the early 20th century Reginald Punnett uh, created a diagram called the Punnett square that uses probability to show the possible outcomes of genetic crosses and really explain Mendel's observations. A Punnett square allows for us to observe how the genes from one parent and the genes from another parent are going to combine to create the potential outcomes of a cross. So for example, here we have a, a purple flower, hybrid purple, crossed with hybrid purple. And there are three out of four chances for you to get a purple flower and one out of four chances to achieve a white flower when these alleles combine. 
Now let's examine uh, some of Mendel's principles through the lens of a Punnett square. Let's begin with Mendel's principle of dominance. With Mendel's principle of dominance, we started off with a P generation, the pure bred generation, pure tall with pure short. Now in order to set up a Punnett square, the first thing you need are the genes of the parents. And so we know that pure tall has only tall genes and pure short only has short genes. To place them on the Punnett square, we separate those alleles because Mendel observed that each parent only gives one inheritable factor to their offspring. They get separated. You might remember that this separation will take place during meiosis. And so we separate the alleles. This happens for both parents. Then we're going to observe how those alleles combine. So what happens when this parent fertilizes with this parent? And we do that with each of the squares. So that way we end up with the potential outcomes. So what we have here is the genes that can be inherited by the offspring. We call that the genotype. Those are the genes that we inherit. So in this case, four out of four um, are heterozygous. They have one uh, dominant allele and one recessive allele. Um, and so we call this our genotype ratio. Now our genes also will provide us with our physical appearance. So if we have uh, a tall gene and a short gene, because of the principle of dominance, the tall is going to mask that short and we end up being tall. So every single one of the offspring are going to be tall. So our physical appearance, our phenotype ratio is four out of four tall, so 100% tall. So the offspring weren't medium because blending doesn't take place, but instead they were all tall because that tall trait masked that recessive short one and that's what showed up. The tall trait is dominant and that's Mendel's principle of dominance where one allele will mask or cover up the other. Now the other main principle that we can look at here is Mendel's principle of segregation. To observe segregation, we're going to start off with uh, two hybrid tall pea plants, two pea plants that are heterozygous for the tall trait. Once again, knowing their genes, we can then separate them. We can uh, allow for them to separate away from each other. And then they're going to reform in the offspring when they combine through fertilization. So the first square, we're going to get all tall genes. Then if we move to our next square, that's going to be one tall and one short. And then one tall and one short. And then lastly, two short alleles. So when we interpret this Punnett square, um, the genotype ratio is a little bit different because one is all tall, two have one tall and one short, and there's one that's pure short. So the genotype ratio is one quarter homozygous for the dominant, pure dominant, two quarters or 50% are heterozygous, and one quarter is pure homozygous recessive. Then when these genes give their physical appearance, if you have only tall genes, then you're going to be tall. If you have a tall and a short one, you're still going to be tall because remember, the tall mask the short. And then finally, if you only have short genes, the only thing you can be is short. So for our phenotype ratio, the physical appearance, we have three quarters that appear tall and one quarter, which is short. So the principle of segregation basically says that the genes will stay separate and they segregate away from each other um, and are able to recombine in the next generation. That our alleles are inheritable factors. They don't blend. They stay separate away from each other and can recombine during fertilization. So that's why our short plant can come back in the F2 generation because the short gene didn't blend with the tall. It stayed separate and was able to segregate away. 
So with Mendel's discoveries and Reginald Punnett's Punnett Square, we're really able to explore the fundamentals of genetics. From here, we're going to continue to build on these fundamentals. And we're going to uh, be looking at not only how single traits are inherited from parents to offspring, but how multiple traits are inherited from parents to offspring. And then we're going to go beyond Mendel and see how um, different ways that we can get our traits that Mendel could not have observed in his pea plants. So stay tuned. The race starts with the act of love. Tens of millions of spermatosa rush ahead on a hunting trip that may eventually lead to a fateful encounter and a promise of new life. Only one can win. The rest will end their lives in a matter of days. In the marathon race to life, there are no consolation prizes. Only one winner will merge with the ovum. The sperm move forward by wiggling their tails through the dangerous obstacle track, the acidity in the vagina, the cervix and the uterus. The obstacles claim many lives. The slow and weak give up. Others go off track, lose direction or get trapped. The road separates into two fallopian tubes, but there is an ovum waiting in only one of them. Not only stamina and talent count, this journey also requires a lot of luck. Strong currents prevent the sperm from continuing forward. The follicles on the uterine wall capture many and hold them back. Finally, at the end of the tunnel, like a mysterious star, the ovium. The sperm attack is merciless. A sperm cell carries a mysterious load. Each can create a unique human being unlike any other in the world. Now, there are only about a hundred sperm left competing for the ovium but only one will make it through the ovium's protective layer. In their final efforts, one suddenly manages to penetrate. It is the winner. After the ovium is pierced, it hardens and becomes impermeable. For the rest of the sperm, the journey has ended in failure. For the winner, it is the beginning. It sheds its now unnecessary tail and load and is free. The father's genetic material merges with the mother's. The new and unique cell is created, the fertilized ovium. At this moment, almost all of the future baby's features are determined, and fetal development begins. Within a week of conception, your fertilized egg, known as a blastocyst, will make its way to your uterus. The egg is about the size of a pen tip. In days, the cells in the egg arrange themselves into groupings, the inner cell mass will become your baby. The outer cells will become the amniotic sac and placenta. The blastocyst then sheds its protective casing in a process called hatching and burrows into the lush uterine wall. Around week five, your developing baby is the size of a sesame seed. The cells that once formed the blastocyst's inner cell mass begin organizing and arranging 
giving shape to the young embryo and forming primitive organs. Your baby's brain and spinal cord are visible through his translucent skin. Right around this time, your baby's circulatory system also forms, and his heart begins to beat. Your baby looks more like a tiny tadpole than a human. He's drawing nutrients and oxygen through the newly formed placenta and umbilical cord. By week nine, the embryonic tail is gone. Your baby's looking more human every day. With protruding limbs and fingers, a defined nose, mouth and eyes, and tiny earlobes. Your new resident is about the size of a grape and weighs a fraction of an ounce. It's hard to believe how rapidly one cell evolves in such a short time into the unmistakable body of a baby. At 10 weeks and barely the size of a kumquat, your baby is entering the fetal stage of development. His facial features are defined and his tooth buds are forming. Over the next weeks, his tissues and organs will rapidly grow and mature. The webbing is gone between his fingers and toes, and his nails and fingerprints are developing. Your baby can open and close his fists and curl his toes. Thanks to his developing muscles and reflexes, he's now moving his limbs and kicking up a storm. If this is your first baby, though, you likely won't feel his flutters until 18 to 20 weeks. Through translucent skin, his vital organs are visible and functioning, including his growing brain, nervous system, intestines, and liver, which is making red blood cells in place of the disappearing yolk sac. The umbilical cord is working hard now. One vein delivers oxygen and nutrient-rich blood to your baby. Two arteries then carry the blood away. Around week 12, the kidneys have begun producing urine, which your baby will soon start excreting into the amniotic fluid. He'll swallow the fluid and the process will begin again. By week 14, your baby's eyes and ears have moved into place and he can squint, frown and grimace. You're now beginning the second trimester of pregnancy, which many women say is when they feel their best. Between 15 and 20 weeks, your baby will more than double in size. As his body grows, his nervous system is rapidly maturing. His nerves are connecting his brain to the rest of his body, traveling from the brain through the brain stem and down the spine, and beginning to extend into his torso and limbs. Your baby's skeleton is changing too. The soft cartilage is starting to harden into bone. This happens first in the arms and legs. Sensory development is picking up speed. Your baby's brain is designating special areas for smell, taste, hearing, vision and touch. At this stage, your baby may be able to hear your heartbeat and voice. So read aloud or sing a happy tune. Your baby may even be sucking his thumb now. At about 18 weeks, you'll start to experience one of the most exciting parts of pregnancy, feeling your baby's movements. His flexing arms and legs may feel like gentle flutters at first. They'll become even stronger and more frequent in the weeks ahead. At 20 weeks, your baby weighs a little more than 10 ounces and measures about 10 inches from head to heel, about the length of a banana. This week is a big milestone, the halfway point in your pregnancy.